Good morning. Um, I want to talk about what I think is one of the most challenging parts of, of playing the piano comfortably, and that is playing octaves. Certainly something that I have struggled with for more than my fair share of time, um, but I do feel like I have learned some things, so I would like to share what I've learned. A lot of what I know is indebted to um, Dorothy Taubman, Edna Golansky, of course my own teachers, Beta Kaplinsky and Julian Martin, so I'd like to give them a shout out of thanks for their hard work. Um, first thing that you have to know about octaves you, is you need your hand to feel small. If you feel like you're making a large reach every time you play the piano, it's going to be uncomfortable. Stretching here in an uncomfortable way is going to create a lot of arm tension. So you need to feel that the octave is not such a large thing after all. Two different ways that you can think about this in order to overcome this idea that an octave is small and to consider it to actually be a small interval. Uh, first of all, let your hand open more here uh, between one and two. This is a, a, a better uh, place to open up. Trying to open up here, here, and here is doomed to be a failure. So let it, let it be more open here. If that is unsuccessful, something else that I've tried uh, with myself and with students is to first play two white notes or two black notes as a sixth and to feel it as being very comfortable. Once I've achieved a very comfortable sixth, I will passively open my hand to a seventh and then to an octave. And suddenly an octave only feels two intervals up from a sixth, not as this massive, powerful, Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky, Listian power chord. So I think that's a, that's a very important distinction. Um, the second thing I would talk about with regard to octaves is the use of the wrist. Um, we want to make sure that the wrist is not floppy. Um, there's a difference between being firm and being stiff, but there's also a difference between being relaxed and being floppy. A lot of people, when they're tight, they think that the thing to do is just to release this entirely. What that results in is a movement like this. My wrist just broke. Because my wrist broke, all of the energy that wasn't needed in playing the key went down into here. I have no possibility of a bounce from the bottom of the key if my wrist breaks. It's a lot like trying to dribble a flat basketball. If you take a basketball and you remove all the air and you try to dribble it, it just flops on the ground and stays there. You have to fill it with air for it to be buoyant enough to bounce. Similarly, I need to make sure that my wrist is supported enough so that there is the possibility of a bounce off the bottom of the key. Um, second thing I would say about the wrist is that we do want to change the position of the wrist slightly based on the height of the key. A white key is going to require a slightly higher wrist. A black key is going to require a slightly lower wrist. Um, this can be partly proven just by showing what it would look like if I did the opposite. If I did a low wrist on white and a high wrist on black, it looks exaggerated. It's a lot of extra movement, and if you're trying to play quickly, you don't have time for that. Um, so if you have a higher wrist on white and a lower wrist on black, you actually don't see that much wrist movement. So on and so forth. Um, it's worth noting um, that in general the wrist should be higher um, in octaves than it would be in scalar passages. You know, for scalar passages, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go in and out slightly based on white key or black key. But for octaves, I need to have a higher wrist in order for the strength to go down into the fingers. If it's below here, I'm already putting a strain on my forearm just by doing this. Also, when my wrist is low, it's extremely difficult to lift my fingers without causing additional tension. So keep a, a basically higher wrist, and then you can feel that your hand is slightly opening and closing as you play your octaves. Okay, so those are some preliminary observations. Now, how do we move from octave to octave? Um, first, we have to feel that every octave itself is not a burden. That was the idea behind making the hand feel small. But we also need to feel that the effort in playing an octave is extremely minimal. And I believe the best way to do this is to feel that when you play an octave, you're basically dropping passively. Gravity is on your side. And this opening motion creates a very strong position in the hand. So um, to practice this, you might try taking a book. Um, for today's use, we have Rachmaninoff for hands. Thank you, Rachmaninoff, for your help. Take your hand and just drop it on the book. Um, I like to start with a book because there's no psychological fear of missing the notes. So we're simply free to do the movement without 
um, any reactionary movement toward um, the fear of a mistake, like hitting the wrong note, playing it the wrong way, not liking our sound. So I use a book to drop, and I feel the, the passiveness of that drop. Once that feels sufficiently good, I'll try the same thing on the piano. And we just have to remember that it's the same movement. Um, sometimes people will feel a slight increase in tension when they do it on the piano. This is strictly psychological. That is triggering a change in movement. So go back to the book, try it again, then go back to the piano until this feels exactly the same. In fact, this should feel better. The springiness of the key should make this a softer landing than landing on a hard book. So eventually this should actually feel better. Um, it should be noted at this point that there's no advantage to pushing on the bottom of the key. The drop is simply to get you to the bottom of the key and rest there, not continue to push. Um, as you may have heard before, the point of sound is about, you know, maybe halfway, two-thirds of the way down the key, and it is at that point that the hammer is sent flying up to the string. After I've reached that point of sound, I can do absolutely anything and everything to the bottom of the key with to, to no effect. So it's important to not keep pushing. The only thing that people accomplish by pushing on the bottom of the key is increasing tension, um, decreasing their speed, and often hurting their tone quality too. And I know this from personal experience, uh, from trying to create powerful octaves and pushing on the bottom. It's challenging um, to not do this because intuitively we think that pushing down makes sound, therefore if I want a bigger sound I must keep pushing down. But again, um, the sound happens not at the bottom of the key, but just above it. So we don't want to continue pushing. There is an important use of the bottom of the key, but we'll get to that in just one second. Now, how do we get from octave to octave? Here I think the best um, demonstration, there, there are two good ways to think about it. One is dribbling a basketball, and there you have to have enough downward force and enough firmness in the right places that you naturally bounce back. There you might think of the piano as being a little bit like a trampoline. You need enough downward motion in order to be able to send it flying back. However, ultimately this is of no good because no matter how efficient your bounce, your movement back up will never be as great. So best case scenario, you would see something like this. The bounce continually getting less and less. There has to be some movement coming back up. We know this, of course, um, and this results in usually playing in the following way. I've drawn two arrows. There's a downward arrow and there's an upward arrow, and this bottom line here represents the bottom of the key. A lot of people, um, they will forcefully go down into the octave, and then they will forcefully go up into the octave. This results in what the Taubman folks call dual muscular pulls. Um, the idea is pretty simple. If you're using opposing groups of muscles very rapidly, it's going to create tension. Um, so what does one do instead? Well, I think there are two different ways of thinking about it, and one is intuitive and one is counterintuitive. Um, they may be of equal importance. I'm, I'm not sure how one would work it out percentage-wise, but I, but I think it's worth thinking about the intuitive as well as the counterintuitive. The first way to think about it is something we've already alluded to. The movement going down is active toward the bottom of the key, and then the bounce back is passive. So the idea here is that one set of movements is active and the other is passive so that you're not doing dual muscular pulls, you're simply using one group of muscles. Um, again, the idea is that you're using most of your force to go down, and then you bounce back. Um, some people struggle with the bounce. Um, that's really a, another topic for another time, but um, again, this is something that you could practice on a book, feeling the springiness. Uh, if you keep pushing on the bottom of the key, that will kill the bounce. If your wrist is floppy, that will kill the bounce. Um, if you have a little bit of pinching in the outer fingers, that may encourage the bounce. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, you might also practice bouncing on your leg. Your leg is slightly um, bouncy. Pardon my technical vocabulary there. Um, so that's the first thing, and again, this is intuitive, and I think this works especially well if you're going from a black key to a white key. Um, since you're going from a higher octave to a lower octave, it's very easy thinking that I'm going to be active on the first octave, and I'm simply going to fall to the second one. So it's like active, passive. Um, 
Now, there's, there's only one issue that I think can come about by thinking actively in the drop, and that is that it does tend to lead toward pushing too hard on the bottom of the key. And if you're pushing too hard, excess force goes down. That means that these muscles have not released in time. Um, they're still pushing down, again, killing the bounce. The timing really has to be pristine for this to work. So I have an alternative solution, and this works to the, um, the second analogy of um, how, we, how we move from place to place, and that is how we jump. When we jump, all of our energy goes into the ground and propels us up. We obviously don't push the ground down, unless you're Chuck Norris. So you are, um, you're pushing yourself up, and then you land passively on the next space. So the next sticky note for demonstration is the bottom of the key, you jump up from it, and you passively land. Here's where the bottom of the key is extremely useful, and here I, I give thanks to Thomas Mark's excellent book, um, What Every Pianist Should Know About the Body. The bottom of the key does not change. It is not a variable. So you can use it as an excellent starting point for your next movement. So let's say I'm here at the bottom of the key. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use finger muscles slightly pinching. If I slightly pinch them, notice that that raises my hand up, so that is an upward movement. I will also use some movements here. I might even use a little wrist. I'm not sure about that one. Don't hold me to it. But the point is you're using muscles to lift you up. It's very easy to do this movement if you're not also trying to push down at the same time. So it's actually a very easy movement. Um, you let that actively send you up, and then you passively drop. So it's an active motion going up and a passive motion going down. I believe this is basically the only way that you can do octaves from white to black. Why do I say that? Because we're going from a lower white key to a higher black key. So we need action and passiveness right there. So how to practice this other way of doing octaves. And, and I, by the way, I believe it is a good idea to go ahead and, and spend time practicing both an active drop and a passive rebound, and also an active rebound. It's not really a rebound, right? Because it's not rebounding to anything. But an active up and a passive down. Good to practice both of those. I would suggest something like the following. I have this passage from Bartok uh, Piano Sonata. Um, I'm going to passively sit on the bottom of the first octave. I'm going to jump up from it and passively land on the next one. So this is active, this is passive. As I passively land, my hand opens. Okay, now I'm going to passively play this one down. I'm going to actively jump to the next one. Passive down, active up. So it would, And then the next step would be something like this. doing when I play is I drop. Then I jump up and I actively land. I believe this way of playing can result in enormous speed. So here is 120. And, and it felt extremely easy to me. And I think the psychological advantage, again, to feeling that you're leaping up from the bottom and landing passively is that you're less likely to over push on the keys. So that's sort of um, a thought on octaves. Again, this is all very inspired by, by you know, Dorothy Taubman, Anna Galinsky, my own teachers, and um, Martin Kaplinsky, and also the excellent book, What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body by Thomas Marks. I highly recommend it. Another practice idea, by the way, is to put the metronome at a fast speed and see if you can do two note groupings very easily. You want to feel that you're touching two places with one motion. So I actively leave, I passively land, here's my beat, that's 120. I'm going to attempt two sixteenth notes, but I want to feel like it's one motion, an active leap and a passive landing. Yep. And then I might do the same thing here, passive landing, active, uh, passive leaving, active landing. And again, this is very helpful. Um, I wish you all the best of luck. I do think it takes a certain amount of practice. Um, it's important to note that the practice and the period of time that it takes to develop this technique is not muscle building. It's building coordination. It's not a matter of how strong these muscles are. It's a matter of how quickly they respond 